Kendall, um, I guess the important thing to say about that is that we need to not feel threatened by this and actually embrace it and join in the conversation. Um, I'm just going to move on to, if people have questions, we'll just keep them to the end and, and all, the, all the speakers will remain in a panel. Um, I'm going to move on to the second speaker, but before I do that, I should say, I meant to say at the start, not to turn off your mobile phones, but put them on silent. Please use them for tweeting, et cetera, obviously, in this, particularly in this uh, session. Um, so the second speaker is Stephen Atherton, who's the National Development Executive for uh, the Higher Education Division at Apple Australia. And he's going to talk about uh, toys like this and how they integrate with things. Um, and uh, take it from there. I'll just welcome Stephen. Thank you. I could switch over to mine. Thank you. Kendall, wow. It's, uh, it's almost as though they planned these sessions, isn't it? Because that's a very natural segue into what I'll be talking about, which is uh, basically mobile learning, M learning. So we've gone from M health to M learning, and there's certainly a lot of crossover. I've got a lot to talk about, so I've put the references to the citations, the apps, the case studies, etc., on this very primitive URL, which is just a text file. I'll throw that up, up at, the, at the end. I'm very keen on looking at educational technology in an historical perspective, and I think we can really analyze the trends that have occurred over time, ranging from the mainframe computer and the research that came from Turing and in cryptology from World War II and so on, to where we are now. Kendall spoke about mobility. It's interesting to note that there was a prediction uh, about a year ago that in the middle of next year there would be an overtaking of access to the internet, not anymore from desktops, and by the way, desktops include notebook computers, uh, but mobile phones, because there are now about five billion on this planet. Well, Morgan Stanley Research got it wrong. That happened about four months ago. So most of the access now to the internet is actually via mobile devices. And it's really difficult to predict what that may mean. In fact, Mary O'Hara points out that historically we've got it wrong when we try to predict the future with technology. We've overestimated the impact of technology in the short term, and just look at the dot-com crash uh, in the long term, and uh, underestimated it in the long term. Now, it's interesting to see that a number of folks in, uh, in various disciplines have looked at educational technology, but also technology and health. Medical Observer, a month ago, ran an article. Uh, it, was, it was fine, I was quite impressed with it, but Walter Rong, who wrote Orality and Literacy, the technologizing of the world, I think dove deeper. And he looked at the impact of Gutenberg's work with the printing press. He even looked at the work of Plato, he looked at Plato's text Phaedrus, where fictitiously Socrates speaks to Phaedrus about this new technology that's external of the mind, affects memory, uh, writing. Of course, it's ironic that he wrote this text. It, Ong then moved on to look at uh, the printing press and the impact that that had, 1439 from memory, and basically a pile of positives. Uh, there was access to information for new social classes, as long as they could read Latin. Uh, information spread very quickly. Uh, the body of knowledge grew from hundreds to thousands. The Bodleian Library in Oxford just uh, basically exponentially uh, grew. Social activism and change was triggered by this. It's no coincidence that Ben Franklin and Martin Luther were tightly connected to the print industry. But let's fast forward about 533 years to last year. The EU ran a report looking at the future of learning, and it was interesting to see that this whole concept of personal devices was reflected in their predictions, because the three hot topics for them, in summary, were personalization, collaboration, and individualization. This is what the mobile devices bring to individuals. This year, our friends from Ernst & Young looked at uh, a paper, The Future of Universities Here in Australia. And uh, there's a lot of reference to the NBN, to access to information, and they were very doom and gloom. It's interesting they note uh, here in the heading that a thousand-year-old institution under threat. Look, it's true, since the 1500s, uh, there are very few institutions that haven't changed a great deal in form and function. There's the Bank of Siena, that's in strife. There's the Catholic Church, we won't go there. There's uh, a couple of parliaments, and there's universities. I actually think these guys are overreacting, and it, perhaps it's no coincidence they ha have consultants that deal with the higher education market, so perhaps they're just generating their own work. But one outfit that I think has done a good job of predicting where educational technology is going is the new media consultant, NMC. Since 2010, they've been doing the Horizon Report in Australia and New Zealand, and for longer in other geographies. 
They used a Delphi research methodology where 42 odd folks got together for the last Aussie paper. They analyzed the, the research. They predict where things are going. These are folks like deputy vice chancellors learning from around the different universities. It's interesting to compare the trends in English speaking university turf to see if there's any commonality in the horizon reports. And there are. Cloud computing, seeing, seen as in the near future as being hugely important, and now. Mobile apps and tablets. And certainly if we look at industry, various industries, uh, we're already there. Ranging from, I noticed when I was on an American Airlines flight recently, no longer the big briefcase being carried by the pilot, but an iPad with procedure manuals and log books and so on on that iPad. And certainly in the health sciences, this is where we are getting, and particularly in education. I think if we focus too much on the technology itself, we'll ignore education. And that's something that Di Lorillard, previous Pro Vice Chancellor of Technology at Open University, mentioned in her book this year, Teaching as a Design Science. Now, a number of folks have analyzed student learning, including tertiary student learning, including your medical students' learning. John Hattie is Professor of Education at Melbourne University. When he was at Adelaide, he released this text, Visible Learning, a meta-analysis of over 800 papers in the turf, basically looking at what it takes to get student achievement increase. And it was about changing pedagogy, essentially. It was about getting involved in active learning, being involved with the student, acting as mentor to the student. There's nothing new about this. I didn't need Hattie to tell me this. My hero is Sir William Osler, founder of modern medicine. And way back in the early 1900s, when presenting to medical and nursing students at Oxford, having set up the Johns Hopkins, he pointed out that the teacher must really become the student. Not everything he said was all that wise. I blame him, for example, for poor bedside manner in some of the professions. And I'm kind of guessing that perhaps his comment is part of uh, orthopedic training, because I particularly <laughs> see it there. But if we look at collaboration and how these mobile devices work, we've seen some interesting trends in medical schools around the world, where collaboration is taken outside of the ward, <laughs> and yes, where we've seen the devices actually become just another tool. And of course, that's evolved somewhat with the release of this smaller unit, where not only it appeals to the hip pocket, but the white coat pocket. A number of med schools are running with these sorts of technologies. This is just an illustration of some of them popping up. I'm going to talk about a few of them. Some of them are just running trials. Some like Harvard and, uh, and Liverpool and Leeds uh, are giving every student one of these devices. Why are they doing that? I think it makes sense to actually hear from Manchester themselves to get an understanding of why. We could have chosen any particular type of, uh, of tablet computer, but we've chosen the iPad because it's got the biggest educational advantages to, to us all. In particular, the wealth of apps that it has is unbelievable. And I'll come back to that in just a minute. So what are the advantages of having uh, a computer that you can carry around with you for the type of education that you have? Well, for three years, you're away from the main university campus. You don't have access to any of the main uh, facilities, the new Alan Gilbert's Common, the library, and so on. And we wanted to give to you something that you could use to keep you in contact with the university, but also um, something that will give you uh, opportunities to, to learn and uh, to carry around information whilst you were away from the university. So what are the real educational um, uh, advantages of, uh, of the iPad? And he goes on to talk First, about e-books. So if I had to look at another trend that's uh, significant, it would be e-books. Although I'm disappointed to say that when I went out to the vendor hall, none of the publishers had actually had a listing of both print and e-book version of their text. So I think we have a long way to go. Now, I could have paid that guy for, uh, for, for, out of my marketing slush fund to say what he said. What is the evidence about student usage? A quick look at students around the globe gives us an idea. These are students from Adelaide, and they're using all sorts of devices that they're just bringing into campus. At Otago University, for over a decade, they've been measuring student usage of devices. And last year, they found that ownership of notebooks, computers, is almost ubiquitous at 98%. But they asked a much more intelligent question, which is, do you have a device other than your notebook that you bring to Dunedin and just expect it to work on the Otago network? And basically, 53% of the students did, which is still lower than the US, where the ECAR study last year found that 63% of students are bringing multiple devices to campus. 
Now, these are general student cohorts. What, what do they do with these devices? The largest study in Australia is the National Student Survey. And they found that uh, access to Facebook is, is usually significant on a daily basis. Large sample group, N equals 16,000, every university in the country. Auckland in 2010 analyzed network traffic, both wired and wireless, to see what students were doing. And it was quite an interesting story. Again, it was recreational use. Now, that was to access things like YouTube and, and, and flash movies and so on, which, of course, are being used for educational purposes. The web access, social networking again. Ownership of phones by students in Australian universities, smartphones in particular, very high, 77%, a jump up from 40-something percent the year before, prediction of being over 90. That's a general student cohort. Let's drill down to med students. Well, it's interesting to note from Adelaide University, it's the same number for the national survey that we have uh, essentially 77% of students owning smartphones and the growth of tablet devices is, in is increasing. Here at UTAS Med School, survey was run this year. Let's have a look at some of the findings there. They surveyed MBBS students, but also biotech, nursing, uh, and paramed students. And they asked a couple of questions. They said, different devices, how are you using them at least at least once a day. Well, in blue is smartphone, in yellow is tablet, in uh, green is notebook usage. So, accessing books, tablet devices. Apps, accessing uh, um, apps, obviously tablet. I was surprised to see here in Hobart that accessing the learning management system was predominantly a notebook experience for them. But when I drilled down, it seems they're not using a mobile portal uh, to their learning management system, or they weren't when this survey was taken. And certainly where they are, Every student at Harvard Med School is given an iPad. They are accessing the learning management system. Most of the use, though, is about email, organizer, and medical reference for the Harvard students. Now, one institution that's been following mobile learning for at least four years is Abilene Christian in Texas. They give every student a device. They've published a lot of their research, but they make an interesting observation. Students interact differently with this device, a notebook, uh, than they do to a tablet device. Let's hear from Brent Reeves. By studying Reeves. how students access uh, online tools such as Blackboard for course content uh, for every hour of the day in a week. If you map out how often students access that data uh, on average for 15 uh, weeks in the semester, it turns out in a class with uh, laptops on Tuesday, Thursday when their classes meet, there's a lot of use but on the other days of the week, not much use. In the class where we had all iPads, uh, the, all the material was online and the textbook was online, if you look at, at what that map looks like, the students in that class tend to access the course materials throughout the whole week. So it's all about the content, is the take home from folks like Abilene Christian. So I'd like to focus on content, apps, uh, open educational resources, and, uh, and also books, e-books. So let's start with open education resource. This is a big movement. If I had to predict an education where ed tech would impact significantly, it is on the content. OER, open education resources, is a growing move. And in fact, it relates to open research. You may be aware that the Finch report in the UK this year argued that any publicly funded research should be open to the public. The Obama administration received a petition this year making the same request. This is a huge threat to the publishers, but it's a trend that's occurring. Open educational content is covered by copyrights such as Creative Commons, uh, and there's a lot.